Right. And so, as usual, I think that we, as I said, 15 minutes late, and uh, we have a lot of things to, to, to tell you, to review, to plan for the future. Maybe have to cut short some, some, some bits here and there. Uh, okay. And so, as usual, normally this time of the year, we all get together to have what we call that the annual, annual general meeting. So in this meeting, we just try to review everything we have, and then uh, we will also tell you what the plan we have for the future. But before that, let's do some of the easier stuff, housekeeping, and who else can be better telling us that things? Uh, are you ready yep. to welcome our guests? Maybe on behalf of the JBS, right? Yeah. Um... Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming so early in the morning. Um, uh, my name is Bang, and I'm, I'm a member of the VIS. And uh, so not a lot of things to do, but we are in the historical building of uh, the Judge Business School. It was actually the former site for the university hospital. And now the, the, the hospital is moved out of the, of the um, city, and it, it has become the biggest like a hospital in Europe. So it, it too, it's too small for a hospital here. Uh, if you want to have a look at uh, the business school, it, not only this building, you can just go by one of the stairs to the back of the building and you're going to be entering a new uh, building called the Simon Sinsbury uh, building. Uh, now, logistic, logistically, I think that uh, we're going to have our meeting here and then we're going to have our lunch. Uh, for TED celebration, but not here, unfortunately. It's going to be at one of the 35 colleges uh, of Cambridge in a very typical dining hall. And the college we're going to be in is Westminster. Now, you have two ways to go to that, uh, to this uh, uh, place. Um, if you are confident enough and sportive enough, then go there by walking. Okay, You can walk there. It's going to take you, uh, depending on how good you are Okay, in walking, 15 to 20 minutes. And then you basically uh, go out of the school, turn right, and then just 200 yards or 300 yards, whatever, whenever you can, and you can turn left, and you're going to be in a big road uh, that is called Queen's Road. That is basically the road that go across all the back of the colleges. And then you turn right and ask for Westminster College. And it is something like 15 to 20 minutes walk. If you are lazy enough, then just like call uh, the main taxi uh, company here, Panther Taxi. You just go to you know like uh, uh, internet and call for Panther Taxi, and from here it's gonna take you five minutes to go there. You ask for Westminster College, and then when you arrive at Westminster College, you ask for dining hall, okay? And then and then it take you five minutes at probably five to seven pound, okay? So if you are two or three or four. With children, I would recommend you just to call a taxi. It's quite quick. It's going to take you anything from two to five minutes for the taxi to arrive, okay? And then five minutes to go there, okay? Uh, otherwise... Um, uh, that's perfect. Uh, okay. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so uh, just to national if you don't know me already, that I'm uh, a professor of digital communication engineering, uh, I'm also the chair of the the society now. And uh, alongside me, I got the uh, professor, associate professor uh, Vinh Doan, and he's also the vice chair of the society. Uh, Vinh Doan and Kui Anh will be leading a lot of the reviewing and also the, the what to see what we have done for the last year. So uh, also I can see here, uh, even though early in the morning, but I can see a lot of members coming from all over different country, four nations actually in the UK, and on some friends, some uh, colleagues all over. Maybe you're gonna have a chance. I will introduce in person later. But now let's not get in the way between Vin and his review of VIS, what they have done in 2023. Over to you, Vin. Thank you, Anu. So good morning, everyone. My name is Ving Don, and I'm the vice chair, one of the vice chair of VIS. And I would like to um, review the activities that we have last year uh, for VIS. So as compared to the year 2022, I think 
uh, VIS in 2023, we have few kind of main program, a bit more well structured, including um, the coffee talk series. Um, the event in Middlesex University to celebrate 50 years, um, the relationship between Vietnam and UK, and also the um, the mentoring program with uh, British Council. Yeah. Okay, so... Can I just bother you at one second, okay. because we are also on Zoom, and I would like just to turn on the, okay. the, 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 the webcam. Just one second, sorry. Is that clear? It is recorded, uh, and I have not turned on the, the webcam, okay? Yeah, just want to pick up the it's a hybrid mode. We have a lot of people. So we have to share the screen. And I heard that even, even people from Vietnam is listening to this. Uh, is it recording? Is it recording? We, we are recording. Uh, We're going to share then. Uh, Can anybody help me with that? I, I'm not. What can you help? Me? So we have to turn on the. Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Turn on the ca the camera. Mm -hmm. And what else? Share share document because we have to share that. How do we make it like double click or oh, this one? Okay, we have to share now. Share the screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so let me. So do you? So I need to share. I guess the share screen. We already share screen. Yeah. So um, can anyone online tell me exactly what to see here on the screen? Have you? What do you see on the screen? We are. It's not my Yeah, you. We can see that. Yes. No, because we, are, we have done this every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. We don't know how to share the screen. Yeah. Can yeah. So it's working now. Can anyone tell me? Can you minimize that? Uh, yeah, I see coffee talk series. Uh, the coffee talk series. Thank you. So that's what we want to share with you. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Okay, so um, sorry for that. So let me continue. So I think the first the first program that we have in 2023 is the Coffee Talk series. So the objective for the Coffee Talk series to introduce the research that we've done here in the UK for people, the VIS members, and also people who are interested in from Vietnam. So we do have one or two uh, talk, coffee talks, only about 30 or 40, 45 minutes online. And it's kind of broadcast and recorded and everything we publish on our YouTube channel. So we have about 13 coffee talks in total. We have 25 uh, speakers. Um, in addition to VIS member as a speaker, we also have uh, people from industry, such as uh, Mr. Phong Chun from Vietnam International Law Firm, uh, Ms. Bao Ha from Deutsche Bank, uh, Dr. Minh Nguyen is from uh, Doris UK, a kind of civil engineer uh, company. And we would like to thank, special thanks to the two MC that uh, continue uh, with the Coffee Talk series, that Dr. Uh, Minh Cheng and uh, Ms. Uh, um, Linh Chua, that already uh, follow, um, help us uh, support us in this kind of coffee talk series for a lot. Okay, so that would be the first activity that we do have. And I think this is kind of a program that we want to move forward in 2024 as well. So the second, the second big event that we uh, were able to, um, to plan and organize is this one to um, commemorate and kind of celebrate 50 years the relationship between Vietnam and UK um, in the uh, under the topic that UK Vietnam partnership in innovation and education. So this event uh, happened in Middlesex University, and we do have about 250 uh, participants for that event. Uh, we do have our honorary uh, chair, uh, Professor Sir Chonavant Van Tham, deliver his kind of distinguished uh, lecture. Um, 
under the uh, leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic and lesson for um, innovation and education. In addition to that, we do have the roundtable uh, talk um, organized by um, uh, Tian. Um, one of the um, member of uh, VIS uh, executive board with the distinguished guests, uh, with the vi um, Professor Nick Beach, Vice Chancellor for Middlesex University. We do have um, the um, His Excellency's uh, Ambassador Huang Long from Vietnam. And we also have uh, Mr. Jim Battles, uh, the founder and the managing director of Pagoda Project. So um, it's, um, it's a I th we think it's a very good event that attracts quite many people. So the next one, the next big thing that we, we did last year was the um, collaborative um, program, mentoring program with British Council and also the Vietnam and UK uh, Higher Education Network. So this mentoring program is to support people from Vietnam, early career researchers from Vietnam. Um, and we provide uh, mentors for those people. And we have about 80 mentees registered for this particular program. Um, in addition to the mentoring um, uh, uh, activities, we also have a, a series of workshops. And the first workshop already um, happened. And that workshop is about uh, publishing your research output. Uh, we also have everything recorded. And that workshop is also on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay, so in, ad in addition to those kind of three big program we do have, so we start with the year similar to this annual, uh, annual meeting, and we have that uh, event in Oxford last year. Um, that would be the HEM also the, the activity. The second one is that um, when um, the Vietnamese uh, president, Robin Thun, um, Robin Boban to uh, come to visit and and um, with the uh, his excellency um, the um, um, to to visit and we have the visit and uh, talk uh, with him about what is done uh, in VIS. We also have um, uh, commemorate um, the 78th National Day and the 50th anniversary diplomatic relation between Vietnam and UK, organized by the Vietnamese um, Embassy in British uh, Museum. Um, we also have the meeting with the Vice Minister uh, Huang Minshen in London, in Cambridge, and Edinburgh. And we have quite a lot of activities in there, in those meetings, with many MOUs kind of signed again between VIS and British Council and other universities in Vietnam. Um, in that meeting in London, we also have um, we have the opportunity to connect with Global Wales so that we have extend our membership to um, uh, other VIS member in Wales. So that would be a very good thing from those meetings. Uh, finally, the last meeting we have is the meeting with the Vietnam-UK Friendship Association and to see explore the opportunity with those kind of um, association together with VIS. So finally, um, last year, uh, we also been able to produce the documentary, and I think this is a uh, lead by uh, Chi Quyan. Um, this is a documentary um, and uh, produced by the Hanoi uh, TV, uh, Hanoi uh, TV network, and I think it's already um, uh, kind of um, broadcast uh, in January this year. We also have a uh, article in the special edition of the diplomats, uh, the diplomat that uh, introduced VIS in in that special uh, um, um, art in that ASEO series of the diplomat for that one. Yeah. So um, that's everything that everything that I want to tell about the equity that we have uh, last year. And I think the next thing that I would have to give back to uh, Huan to talk about. Um, Finance. That's the most important part. Yeah. Oh. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Ving. Um, so you can see that uh, you see that uh, we we get some photo there. We're shaking hand with the top leader from Vietnam and here and there. But you didn't know that behind the scene we work really hard. So many things we, we wouldn't know. Preparing for an event is not easy. Maybe Mark would know very well that things. Eh? So much behind the scene preparing for those things. And so I just wanted to tell you that. Uh, we appreciate all the effort from our team member. And um, maybe just before I forget, I wanted to say here officially that a big thank you to everyone, especially from the uh, executive board and the secretariat team, all supporting us in many ways. 
Right. Um, the finance, yes. So um, we, we, we were founded uh, on the voluntary basis. So at the beginning, we thought that we don't need money, you know. Everyone just come here for a passion. Uh, we really care about Vietnam. We care about getting together. And uh, we're happy to to pay from our pocket for a pie when, when, when we went to the pub together to plan for what's next year activity. No problem. But then eventually we think that oh, it wouldn't work uh, all the time. So, and uh, then we started to plan that, okay, all the, you know, we got so many professors in finance, so money is not a big deal. And, and uh, and then um, yes, we started getting. What's the best thing we do? We we, we apply for so many funding projects here and there for university. How about that one for our own? And so we started with small thing, not a big thing. Just uh, fifteen thousand pounds. Let's say that that already we see that we can do many things with that. So uh, I wouldn't go into much detail of this because uh, the right person to talk about this is Vern, but unfortunately she's not here. As I said, she's so busy helping with many other things, and uh, but she sent us some of the things here. I, I cannot say in too much detail, but I believe that all the figures look good to me. So, uh, so, uh, not nothing wrong, right? And I want all of you to look carefully to see that anything is not accurate. But uh, from my engineering heart on, I think it all seems good. And uh, what what I want to say that we we do have some money for our activities, and then uh, that that's a very good thing. But going forward, I believe that um, as a, as a society, as also there are a few things we can learn from the Vietnam UK network that uh, maybe to be more sustainable, we need to have like some of the thing activity that we can get some incomes, we get sponsor everything because what we do is good, but the impact need to be bigger. And to, to make that happen, we need to have everyone to come together, sponsor companies, uh, technology firms, everyone. So that also one of the things we will talk about later on. Um, so uh, you can see that maybe the most important thing, the total income we have so last year, 16,000 pounds. We spent so far 7.7 pounds, so still plenty of money left for us, 12,000 or something, right? Okay, and uh, with that, maybe I move on very quickly from this. If nothing wrong with this, uh, 2024, no, not yet, right? Okay, yes, it is 2024. Um, we realize that, you know, I said there's so much behind the scene, so much hard work, and then we need more people to come to help us. And uh, that's why you can see here, every single one from the last year in our executive board stay here, not going anywhere. They all committed to the, to the course and then helping you to do more. But we are expanding. We cannot just stop for uh, 10 executive members. So you can see that why we have different colors over there because the one with the slightly different color in which are the new ones joining us today. So whether they are online now, because some of them come from Ireland, from Northern Ireland, I don't think they fly over here, but at least some of the new member in the room. So. The best thing is that I invite them to have few words. Cern and Ling, uh, you are here, I know for sure. Uh, Miley, Miley, are you here or maybe you on online? Mine's online, right? Maybe once we have the chance, we can ask her to, to say a few words. But start from you, uh, Cern. I know that, uh, you know that in Vietnamese, we call it Giáo Sư Nhật Giác because he's so famous on VN Express that he got so many awards, many things, but nobody really know. But when it comes to VN Express, the whole country is so crazy about him. Kids, kids try to want to learn, want to learn from him that can I stop just doing some of the rubbish collection and then I want to become like him. Sir, what can you do for the society? Maybe say if you were to say hello and any suggestion. Yeah, thank you very much, Anh Huan, for the introduction. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ming Sun Pham. I'm a senior lecturer in uh, at Imperial College London. Um, so uh, very much, I, I could not um, tell anything um, apart from I do. I love my job and um, just do my best every day um, and go to sleep, uh, have good sleep, <laughs> uh, keep good health. Um, I think that's very good advice. <laughs> I, I think that's able to offer to all of us. Um, so that's it. Um, so I'm very happy to be a member of the society and. Uh, 
Yeah, um, hope to connect um, everyone here with uh, the college, Imperial College, and also with um, uh, people in Vietnam and uh, very happy to contribute to and strengthen uh, the society. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, sir, and thank you. I would say that's a great addition because CERN have done so much for the for the Vietnam UK activity a relation already. You you know that he also leading what we call that uh, my own university and his own universe, our university from Vietnam, you know, Hanoi University of Science and Technology. He's the chair of the Vietnam uh, the alumni network in the UK here. Okay, and not just CERN, uh, we have the young woman who, who done so much, I would say that she's leading the woman in STEM uh, initiative. Ling, are you here? Come have a quick word with us. You get a, a grant of almost 1 million pounds the other day. We say that is excellent. And maybe there are a few things you can share with us and tell us about yours, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, my name is Lin Nguyen and uh, I'm a lecturer at the University College London and um, I'm, uh, is it my honor to join the, the team and uh, thank you very much for uh, trusting me to put me in the team and uh, I will contribute as much as I can to uh, develop the for this activity in the especially I'm very interesting for the woman in STEM or uh, in engineering or even though for entrepreneur because uh, recently mostly the CEO uh, mostly is the man so if more women be a leader is will be inspired uh it's will be better and uh, enjoy uh today for the dead holiday thank you Ling, yes as i said that we need people like you young people full of energy and uh, as i said before that we need members from london as well because like it or not a lot of our activities still based in london and we need uh, a member from london so CERN and Ling is based in London, so that's great. But not only in London, we have like the member from Ireland, uh, Ngo Quoc Hung, and Professor Miley from Cardiff, and uh, Ngo Quoc Hien from Northern Ireland. You see that for the first time, we can proudly say that we have all representatives from four or five nations in the country. Uh, so that's a great thing. Whether you are online now, I just wanted to say that so much. We appreciate the, uh, the effort to joining us and very warm welcome to the VIS Executive Board 2024. We may not be able to turn on the speaker to, to listen from you, but later on, if we can. So uh, we will give you that opportunity. Again, thank you, uh, all, the, all three of you from online. So now, Let's say that is the next step in... Oh, yes, yes, okay, I forgot that, thank you. Let's see that, as I said, that a lot of things behind the scene has been supported and mainly carried out uh, been, uh, by the secretariat team, you know? You know that they do all the hard work. We just give them ideas and then they just implement smoothly. Unbelievable. You know, sometimes it's, words cannot say how much we, we appreciate their support. So um, this year, as I said that, we're expanding in every, every aspect, including the support team. So we have the, still the same member, Phương Anh, uh, leading the team here. And we got Tuyen. Hi. Hi. It's not here yet, right? And... Uh, but uh, Chung Ling Huyen is not new to us. She has been supporting. If you're watching the Coffee Talk, our brand name, we established very well that uh, Coffee Talk. You know, we mentioned that, but it become one of the things they talk about this, that, oh, when, when the Coffee Talk uh, happen again? I just want to say that very soon. Okay, so uh, Ling Huyen is a charming MC uh, together with Kong Ming. They're both from Oxford. Um, and uh, Ling Huyen been obviously joining the, our, our uh, secret, uh, secretary team as well. And we have the Dong, Dong from Chakalai, but he's been in London, so he's very handy for us. And we got Viet Anh, I think Viet Anh in this room. He's a local boy here. And I'm sure that he will help us a lot with that. Okay, thank you, Viet Anh. Okay, so maybe that, uh, did I miss anyone else? Okay, that's good. I think this bit, maybe I leave it to the end, right? Later, proposal. How about now I invite Kui Anh? Uh, you have just certain uh, time to go through what the VIS achievement, both from the collective point for the society and then the individual as well. 
please, yes. Uh, Guyan is the vice chair of the society. We have two vice chairs at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think I have an easy job. The people behind the achievement is the one who um, to be congratulated. So, congratulated. Um, so first of all, um, as an organization, we have grown very fast in the last year. As you can see that the number of members uh, in 2023, we have welcomed more than 60 new members, making the total of 154 um, in our database. Um, we have managed to produce and upload 32 YouTube video from various activities, and it's going to be a good result for um, members as well as, as um, other academic communities. Uh, we, for this achievement and work, we were selected and then award the community organization in the UK um, at one of the um, outstand young but outstanding Vietnamese international uh, award um, in London. And then well done everyone. And this is actually collective um, efforts. And I think that we have always say that our trend lies in the collective voice, collective intellectual capacity. Um, but we also an organization made of an excellent uh, individual. Um, I um, mentioned here a few individual, but I'm sure that this is just um, an example. Uh, we haven't um, managed to gather all the year. Thank you. Um, so this, despite the fact that the, um, the entire higher education sector in the UK faced challenges in the past year, our VIS members have done very well at their own institution in various ways. Here are only some of example. I'm sure there are more. We would like to congratulate congratulate um, this particular individual, uh, Professor Tang, uh, Dr. Ming Sun, and Dr. Ken Ling Nguyen, and, and um, many others, um, new professors. So on the, on the screen, you see six new members of this has been promoted to uh, full professors in the last uh, 18 months, in fact, and making a total of 15 full professors in the, so in the society. I would quickly um, mention some major achievement of each individual. So Professor Nguyen Kim Tang is one of the world leading uh, scientists in nanomaterial. Um, last year, she has, uh, she has won many prizes, but last year she has been selected and award um, Thomas Graham Prize by the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK. This award is for mid-career researcher, outstanding researcher in um, chemistry um, and this prize is named after um, a scientist, Scottish scientist, um, and he's known for Graham Law, and he's a pioneer in a colloid uh, chemistry and is a founder of the, uh, the, the British um, Chemistry Society. Um, I hope Professor Kim Chang is online, and on behalf of this, we would like to uh, congratulate you and would like to welcome you to our future activity. And uh, Dr. Ming Sun, um, I think you are one of the young talent scientists in our uh, VIS members uh, who has been uh, selected uh, for the uh, very special World 2024 Young Innovator in Material Science of Addictive Adjective Manufacturing Award. And this award is a very special one. It's only given to one individual, outstanding individual in the field. Um, and over, uh, under under 40 years old, and our member Ming Sun is um, the winner for this year. And Sun uh, has been invited also to um, give a keynote lectures uh, in a two weeks times on Monday the fourth of March. And normally in in uh, in this event, 
uh, in the US, normally the annual lecture like this attract about 4,000 participants. So we would, we would like to be part of that and uh, we wish you um, every success for that special lecture. Ming Sun had also joined our mentoring scheme that um, mentioned earlier, and he actually um, supporting two um, early career, uh, career researchers from Vietnam, Lê Mạc Tu and Pháp Xuân Phương. Thank you for that, Sun. Uh, we also have Dr. Uh, Kelly Nguyen at Cambridge. I hope she's either here or online. She's also another young scientist um, and has been awarded um, Colworth model, um, a medal uh, of the Biochemical Society. And this um, special award has been uh, given to young scientists in 1963 um, for the scientists within the 10 years, first 10 years after they received their PhD. We mentioned that there are, um, there are six professors has been promoted in the last 18 months. Um, Professor Phan Ngoc Anh, uh, School of Engineering, Newcastle University, Chair of Circular Chemistry Engineering. Uh, Professor Phan Anh also has worked with a number of ASEAN countries. She is a member of the World Class University Association with Thailand, and she is also a mentor of two mentees under the program's um, mentoring program with the British Council. Professor Hong Bui. So we, we do have professors in both STEM subject and social science and humanity. Professor Hong Bui, who moved from Bath University to um, Birmingham City University and become professors um, in the past two years. She's the director of research innovation enterprise at the Graduate School of Management uh, at this university, but she also um, working with Vietnam in various capacity and various projects. She has um, mentored um, about 100 earlier career researcher, academic inside and outside the UK. Um, she was also selected by Force Vietnam in 2021 um, to be on the list of most inspiring women in, in the country. Um, some of these slides are provided by the, the individuals. So I know some information about them, but not all. So I would like to share with you the joys of um, being promoted and also also to pride that our society share with its members. Um, professor Tam Nguyen is the, probably the newest professor um, from last last month. Um, she He is not here today, but he, uh, has been one of the active members of uh, VIS. He has been promoted um, full professor at Nottingham Strand University in finance. Um, he's also part of our mentoring program and mentored two mentee. Uh, professor Quack McHoud from Lincoln University was also newly um, promoted uh, about half a year ago and now has a very special and long um, career uh, path, and he specialized in um, uh, finance as well as, as banking sectors. Um, he's often um, uh, he he was he was he would regularly um, he he would regular regularly uh, invite the speakers at international uh, conference in Vietnam. He had strong link. He also set up two PhD joint PhD program in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. So we all um, work very very closely with our Vietnamese partner. Uh, last uh, no, uh, Professor Nguyen Ngoc Ngoc Sơn Bui, who moved from. Hong Kong to Oxford, and he was promoted to full professors of Asian law uh, at Oxford, and he also a fellows of St. Hugh's College in Oxford. He um, researched comparative and constitutional law in Asia with a focus on socialist and Confucian culture influence, um, influence uh, jurisdiction. He served in the editorial board of two leading journals, 
Asian Journal of Comparative Law and in the advisory board of the Indian Law Review. Last but not least, Professor Hua Le Ming. Um, I think he's here or on the way uh, here, he's actually helping with the food collection. So we're going to have lunch and we have to thank Professor Hua for this. So um, Professor Ming Hua um, was promoted to um, full professors um, of electrical and electronic engineering at Northumbria University uh, last September. Um, he is the deputy head of Department of Mathematics, Physics, and Electrical Engineering. He is also uh, a former chair of uh, IEEE Communication Society uh, in the UK and Ireland chapter. And uh, he was our vice chair of this society and still in our executive team. Oops. So on behalf of this, I would like to extend our one co our um, congratulation um, to all of these um, outstanding individuals. And now I hand over back to the chair, Huan. Thank you, thank you, Chi uh, Kuan. Well, a lot of achievements, but I have to say that if we miss anything here, because we cannot cover all the uh, the society member. Do you know that we expanded to more than 150 members who are all of Vietnamese origin, but working more in over more than 70 universities all over the UK and Republic of Ireland. So I'm sure that there are a lot of achievements from the individual that we may miss. And if that's the case, please just uh, send us something or we apologize for that. Um, yeah, collectively uh, as a group, we've we, we done quite a lot. We achieved together a lot at the same time individually. There are many individual achievements there. You can see outstanding one. So inspiring story that we couldn't have time to tell you everything here. Uh, but uh, also that part of the AGM, before I, we move on to the next section, can I just uh, say that uh, I can see that welcome of two speakers here already, two professors, local here. So such an honor for us to have you, you both coming here and stay with us. I'm sure that there are a lot of things we, 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 could, we could learn and then uh, we could hear from you, Professor Jaidif, right? And Professor David. And later on, until the section, we still have some for me, few minutes. We wanted to discuss what is plan for 2024 from our society point of view, and then we come to the, the the talks later on. Okay, so uh, we didn't prepare a lot of slides for next year, but we can talk about that. Uh, let me just get rid of this annoying thing. What is this? Anyone tell me? <laughs> Normally, I just take it out and, and then we can read, get rid of that, but it's not the case. Mm -hmm. But then, then it will. Okay, so the society, as I said, that um, the vision is that we always hear for the society first, we serve our own members. We want our own members to feel like if we belong to this society, a lot of benefits, a lot of things. If we got passion to share the knowledge, to share, to build the relationship between Vietnam and the UK. So this is the right place for you. But at the same time, you know, for the own career, for the own benefit, we wanted to, to help you with that. So the first thing is that we'd like to support the progression of the own our VIS members, the first thing. The second thing that as a society, we need to work together with all other communities. Like we can mention that a lot of us association and, and organization that have the same mission that they want to build the Vietnamese communities in the UK and Ireland, for example. So we are here to, 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 to do that together with, with you, with all the other communities. The third thing is that we wanted to also build relationship between Vietnam and the UK. Who else better than all of the professor here who study, graduated from Vietnam and now working in the UK? No, let's say, I wouldn't say inside out, but we, we can be confident that we know the both system from Vietnam and the UK. Then we are in the very good position to connect to build, to develop that relationship. So we have done quite a lot of that already in the last two years. But what in plan for 2024? 
there is still many things that we can do. You can see there are quite a few focus we, we just briefly mentioned in there. The one of the area that we think we could do more is that is what about industry and media connection? We can do more with that. All our impact, you know, that like us, we write papers, but the impact of that paper, we're going to use that as a research outcome, for example. We need to connect with industry in this sense as well. That a very one of the key things that uh, we are vision in there, and uh, so so many other things. You know, some you know the, some of the activity we has been carrying on from the last year. We have to carry on, even though, like, for example, like the mentoring programs, it's so inspiring that uh, it it have a lot of impact for the early career research researcher from Vietnam. You know what? We are helping around eighty early, earlier career researcher from Vietnam. They all the lecturer in Vietnam. You know. We are helping them, actually, we are helping thousands of students from Vietnam in many ways. So that's something definitely we will carry on and with the support from the British Council with that. Okay, Coffee Talk series, as I said that, so inspiring that we already have like, I don't know, maybe 15 Coffee Talks over the last year, more than 20 speakers, most likely all the in-house. But this year, as I said, that we expand to the external speaker. Someone like Mark can come to talk to us, share with us a story. How the Scot Scotland can make the best coffee and uh, whiskey in the world, you know. And many other things that from, from the network we can share with us. So we would like to hear a lot the inspiring story, how you even commercialize or research, and many other things that, that in our coffee talk series. And um, at the same time, you know, uh, another, another vision I would like to see that you may see that we quite close to only academic member. It's about time that we open ourselves and receive maybe some of the key member from the society. It doesn't have to be in at the from university, but someone with a passion to build relationship between the UK and Vietnam. Someone who really matters in many ways, who can make decisions. That's the thing that our society at the time that in 2024, we really want to, right, to, to work with you welcome you, maybe in different capacity. You can join us as uh, maybe honorary members, advisory capacity or any other partners in many ways. So that is something we, 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 the vision that we start working on because we realize that everyone got 24 hours and the amount of energy and effort just also limited. How we can make those efforts have more impactful, that is so important to us, okay? It's the same one hour, it's the same activity, but we want the impact is much bigger. So that is the reason for the next year we're trying to do, right? But uh, still that we need to have the specific action. So now I want it not just about me, I can, I can set out the vision, but I also wanted to hear that specific, can we have some of the more detailed action or activity planned in 2024? Maybe I started inviting because this is also the chance I want to introduce our executive member if you haven't known them already. So uh, maybe I invite one by one, or maybe the whole team to come here with us. Uh, starting from you, Virang, maybe can you come here and, and share with us what do you have from the own point of view, but also on behalf of the executive board, what, what, what in plan? For example, like, yes, so. Thank you, Ang Wen. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, very happy to talk about um, the plan around um, career progression and academic uh, promotions, which uh, Ang Wen had asked me to look into. So I've just done some sort of um, homework uh, last night, actually, uh, when I arrived in Cambridge. And actually, it was, um, I think, um, um, as a result of my discussion with uh, a colleague that I knew many, many years ago. And then uh, I, I talked to him last night that I, I came to Cambridge to join uh, this uh, annual meeting. And he asked me, what is this about, right? What does this do? And then I think one important thing, like you said, is that we, we should try to, to help our, our members. And one way is obviously to help with their career progression and, and how to get promoted. So I guess, you know, um, we, we should try to organize a sort of series or events so that we could talk about um, our experiences. And also, um, as we have seen um, last year, in the last 18 years, um, 18 months actually, we've seen a lot of promotions, successful promotions um, to professorships, right? So uh, this would allow us to uh, showcase our strengths, drawing from the experiences, 
um, sharing experiences with members. And I think the strength of this is that um, we have people working in different areas, social sciences, um, natural sciences, STEM and so on, and also people working in different tracks not just only in the um, normal track of teaching and research, but also in, in um, only teaching scholarship or maybe in, um, in research, for example. There are also people that work um, as earlier career researchers, whereby maybe the focus would be on um, getting probation done and confirmed, but also maybe people who are at the um, later stages of their development, maybe getting to, um, you know, senior lectureships or looking uh, towards building a case for promotion to professorship. So I guess uh, we could have different talks and events targeting different groups and also uh, take into account the unique features and differences in different disciplines. Because for example, in my area, which is finance, grants are not important. Uh, what is more important is about producing research high quality research, but um, in your area, for example, right? And without a lot of grant or, or, or income from funding then, then it would not be possible to get promoted. So then, you know, having that perspectives uh, from different disciplines, I guess, would be quite important. And um, apart from, you know, the usual um, preparation in terms of teaching, research, scholarship, leadership, and so on, I guess it's also important for us to share with our members experiences around some soft skills, in particular, time management. So we have some members here who are extremely, you know, um, doing really well in terms of both um, research, teaching, but also do, um, being a very good husband or wife, for example, right? Um, so, I mean, how do you manage your time effectively? How do you balance work and life? I think these are very important soft skills that we can share. And also, how do you prioritize uh, the work that will help you to get into the ladder more quickly and more effectively? Uh, what are the do's and don'ts in your, um, in your line of work? And also, um, you know, obviously, um, it's not always the case that you can make progress smoothly all the time. There could be setbacks or difficulties and challenges. And how do you overcome those challenges and setbacks? So I guess it would be important, interesting for us to, to share with each other those um, you know, experiences and that can help um, members to, to grow. So um, in the future, I guess we could organize some uh, series and I would hope to get your um, involvement in particular uh, in the involvement of some newly promoted professors, right? Sharing with us your experiences. Could also maybe invite not just only these members, but also external speakers sharing with us, for example, your uh, skills in terms of management, time management and so on. Um, sharing with us and inspiring us and, and hopefully can make us a stronger society. So these are just some sort of um, food for thoughts. And I would uh, look forward to your full suggestions that we could maybe build a program in the next few weeks and hopefully you can organize that uh, in the next few months. So thank you. Thank you, Viren. May, may I ask you to just stay there with us? And <laughs> Okay, that's a great food for thoughts, as you said, that a lot of activity uh, on the pipeline. Uh, but um, you know that this is just not about the UK, it's about the island as well. And that is something we really wanted to develop in the last few years. And this may be about the year that we started moving some of our activity towards island. So maybe the best one I can ask you that, Nam, Associate Professor from uh, University College uh, Dublin. Okay, and flying all over this morning. And he, he told me that actually travel from an island to here is not that difficult. Get to stand that, and then the train directly to here quicker than I, I drive from London. Now, what can we do to build relationship between the UK, Vietnam, and Ireland from their own point of view and on behalf of the society as well? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, just just want to say a few words about uh, these members in Ireland. So, um, so I joined this um, around two years ago, I think. So at that time, uh, we had only two members. And I don't want to uh, to have an impression that you know the the VIP members from Ireland is just a band of this society, and that's why uh, I joined this um, uh, society, and they want to um, develop uh, and grow the VIP uh, society in Ireland. So at the moment we have, I think, just less than ten members. Um, within last year, I think that we have more five members, I guess. So um, one of the activities that um, I, I hope to organize this year is uh, to connect um, members from UK 
an island. So you know that uh, due to the due to the praxis. So there are some. Um, um, I'll say Ireland is now the only uh, English-speaking country in the UK. So because that we have some kind of um, advantages, um, we, we want to connect like uh, UK, Ireland, and Vietnam. And uh, we with, we don't have kind of you know, concrete ideas about how to do that. But I think that we, we may have some um, kind of a socializing event, like playing a uh, soccer mat, uh, so that uh, we can gather and we can talk about anything we want. Um, perhaps the 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 the, the best uh, place to do that is the Northern Ireland, which is the common area between Ireland, uh, not uh, UK. Uh, so I think that is the best way to do that. Um, in terms of um, how say my uh, what I want to do. Uh, no, I mean I, I think that what. Uh, our society can do is to uh, shape or I mean maybe um, tell the lessons um, what we see uh, from the policies in Ireland and UK. We know that many good policies are, are here right in Ireland and UK and somehow we're gonna tell that lessons to the policy makers in, in Vietnam so that um, uh, Vietnam can have uh, kind of, you know, uh, very good policies in, in many areas, education, uh, innovation, technology, so whatever. Yeah. I think that that's all for me. Thank you, Nam. And not just about the social event, I believe that there is some funding scheme between the UK and Ireland. That's something I believe that we underexplore in, in many ways. You know, that there definitely is something between SFI, for example, and EPSRC or UKRRI that we can, we can, uh, I knew that it just submitted a joint funding proposal between the Vietnam and Ireland. So that's another thing. Not many people know that they got some of the channel and then the opportunity like that. So opportunity with Ireland is there. We just need to need to explore that more. Okay, so also that from the other thing, maybe I can I invite the other member who I think that can share with us quickly some of the other, I think that the ITP vision I don't know how long left we got before we got uh, we got around uh, five minutes left. Okay, Anh Hoa uh, and Anh Bang, can you just come here? And also the opportunity you can see that our executive board members who has been active and doing many things. And I will invite you at the end so you can carry on with the uh, with uh, with the uh, the next section because I hope that you can share the next section for us, right? Okay, but you come here. Okay. Uh, start from you, maybe Anh Bang. Uh, what can we do as a, this for 2020 to 2024? Maybe very quickly, if you have any idea, you can share with us. I, I, I don't have a lot of ideas, so uh, I have a few. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, as a kind of uh, an association of scientists, of uh, diverse um, uh, background, I think uh, our association activities should focus on uh, you know, the first uh, uh, thing, which is to promote the production of knowledge. I think that uh, all of us are doing research and, and, and working in, in, in science. So I think uh, as long as we can help each other to, to be better in, in produ uh, producing knowledge, in publishing paper, in, in generating new ideas, in collaborate, collaborating, uh, you know, together, then that's that going to be um, uh, fantastic. I think that our association already has already done some of them. So the mentoring uh, scheme, for example, is a fantastic scheme to help uh, uh, young and 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 um, like uh, young researchers. But I think even for us, you know, uh, people with more experience uh, um, uh, in research um, and in the profession, I think we we also need to do something like better. Uh, so I think uh, activities like organizing some. Uh, you know, we, we should keep the, the, the activity like mentoring, uh, but I think that that you know, not be sufficient. We, we we should think of you know organizing some advanced and more focused conferences on some of the topic of the greatest interest for the UK and for Vietnam. So everybody like is now talking of AI of um, green industry, so on. So I think we have member already working on that, but we have never organized specialized and advanced level. Kind of conferences, activities, and that. I think we should kind of uh, uh, make sure that we use all of the strength of our members uh, in in that kind of advanced technology or, or, or research. That is the first thing, and the sec second aim I think for our uh, association should be for, uh, should be on how to spread 
the research that we are generating and how to make an impact to the society. And we are already doing some 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 of the activities uh, in in the past. So, for example, uh, we are organizing coffee shop. Right, everybody can join, even you know non specialists. I think we should we should keep doing that, but it might not be sufficient. I think that uh, you know, like from the day where we have only a few members of the society, now we have more than one hundred fifties. I think we have more people. We 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 are having now more uh, expertise. We can organize some some some. Uh, bigger event with um, greater impact for the society. So for example, we can uh, uh, organize a few events that will reunite policy make makers, uh, researchers, and even funders uh, in big things, such as green industry, or uh, how to manage uh, the regulation in, in, in tech, and for example, how to regulate AI. That, 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 those are the things that I think uh, on which we can, we can make impact. And last but not least, I think we should do one and two, so in the same time, help the process of uh, generating knowledge, spreading knowledge, but we should do those two things in, in the bigger context of uh, UK and Vietnam relationship. I think that the two countries have decided to uh, make the relationship between Vietnam and the UK at a very high and strategic level. And so if we can focus on doing one and two, but in a bigger context of the close ties between our two nations, it would be, I think, even better. That's it. Thank you. Well, absolutely. I think that, do you know that we always have a chance to meet with the top leader from Vietnam? We can have influence on the, any policy we think that it can help maybe develop or maybe make Vietnam, UK relation better or make Vietnam better. We always looking towards what we can do for Vietnam. Uh, so, yes, in, in that sense, maybe very quickly, we don't have much time left. Uh, professor Le Minh Hoa just promoted to full professor from University of Northumbria. So congratulations for that. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to develop academia and industry relationship in this case. We haven't done a lot of activity in the past with that. Do you have any idea, any plan that as a society we can do more in, in this next year? Thank you, Hung. Uh, Hung um, yes, obviously, I think we got a lot of wonderful idea we share all together, and we have about hundred, more than hundred member of the VIS, and I think all of the academic with a lot of critical mass in the high quality research, and I think we are moving into the impact within the industry. That's very important. So I think a lot of people and have a lot of industry link, so we can link them through sharing knowledge. So the event with the knowledge sharing for industrial experience, working with a company, working impact case study, that could be very helpful for internal ways. But also we can invite the external speaker coming from company, for example, like from Innova UK partner to come to join this. And then therefore we can expand the knowledge by into that area. And obviously I think we have a strong demand in Vietnam in order to develop the industry in Vietnam and through the embassy, through different, you know, the personal link or institutional link, I think that we can link all together through this as one voice. Thank you. All right, thank you. And and now, uh, before the next session, I also wanted to hear from very charming executive member that we we so proud that she bring a lot to the society recently. Chien, do you have any idea? Come, come with us. Uh, for like. You know that Vietnam, UK, we always talk about relationship. We always talk about what we can do together. So I'm sure that you can have a lot of ideas to share with us. Yeah. So thank you very much for introducing. And um, I have been quite happy to be part of this uh, as executive member. We have done here and there different activities over the years. And uh, one of the things we're always kind of like wondering or thinking of how to actually um, and hence our positioning uh, to the external organization as well. And so one of the things is when we do research, and you did mention about production of knowledge and uh, spreading of knowledge or dissimulation, dissemination of knowledge, that is, it's very important that we have these connection with the industry and reach out to other external organization, uh, especially at the country level where every country now have a very similar agenda. You did mention something about AI, you did mention something about green uh, energy or climate change. That's also agenda of the two countries as well, not just the UK and the Vietnam, but it's also in many other countries. So it's actually quite important that why we 
producing the knowledge and disseminate the knowledge, we target a similar common goal uh, by reaching out to organization, to uh, the national agencies or to other countries, or uh, especially our own country, and to see what would be the common agenda so that we can create the interdiscipline projects. And that's what we actually have doing now. Now, one of the things of the university at the moment is not just about promoting the high quality publication, and I'm surely understand that um, in social science, we kind of appreciate more of the high quality of research. Like everyone will ask you, do you have any four, four star? How do you get professor if you don't have any four star paper? But now they actually, they promote more about the, the funding and interdiscipline project as well. And why not? instead of actually collaborate with your own colleague at university, we collaborate with our VIS members as well across dif different university. And that's what um, me and some of the members are actually doing that. I have an opportunity to, to work with Son and Chi Fan Ang, um, not Chi, well, actually I'm too Chi now, so everyone is M for me. But um, but on, on a lot of those, um, Kind of projects aiming at the you know at the similar goal um, in relation to climate change or in relation to some AI or digitalization. So I think that if we kind of looking out for similar kind of project or similar goal and create those kind of collaboration in terms of research, so then we can have even the project on the on digital twins. We miss that one next time. We we'll do that. So I, I think that is really important. But one of the things which I also talked to Hun as well that we are actually a great organization. We actually gather a lot of intellectual here, right? We are actually in the crossroad on the bridge between the UK and Vietnam. We're both intellectual. We have a lot to share. We have a lot to spread. But our position across um, uh, uh, um, externally wasn't known very well. So if we kind of promote that, and I think that uh, in the next year, probably I would also help as well to kind of like, it's not like to PR us, but to make us known so that everyone else will know what we're doing, how important that is, how potential the significant impact we can create. And that will we'll get more of the work to do, but we might also get sponsors as well and for the funding. So I really hope that, uh, that we will together do uh, more of the meaningful work. Thank you so much. Well, wow, uh, thank you very much. That's a great idea. I see mentioned about this between for decarbonization in transport. The UK government just invested 20 million pounds for us to do. How come that I, I'm the director of the London Digital Research Center, but I miss out on that board? Anyway, anyway, I'm still stakeholder of that consortium. We still see each other. Two things I want to do now before the next section. Can I invite all the new and and existing member of the executive board come here because we may have a chance that we got some photo together for the so everyone new and um, while waiting for them i wanted to invite to hear from some external member what do you think that the society can do more maybe mark can i ask you just a very random thing but maybe just a few minutes can you share with us from the point of view looking from the outside as a society of mostly academic member like us what do you think we can do more? You you know Vietnam quite well, I would I assume. So so if you can share with us quickly. Yes. Thank you and uh, and congratulations uh, on on this event and all the work you've done. That's very impressive. And congratulations on the most transparent set of accounts I've seen, down to down to a fourteen pound ninety nine refund from Amazon. You, you didn't say what that was, but uh, uh, there's absolute confidence in the uh, in the handling of the finances. So um, I'm really pleased to be here. As you can see, I'm not Vietnamese, and as you can hear, I'm not an intellectual. Um, but I uh, am. Uh, I used to be the uh, the um, the British ambassador in in Hanoi, and uh, and now, most importantly, I am chair of the Vietnam UK network, and I very very much recognize what you were saying, Juan, about uh, some people saying things and other people doing things. And I've got a lot of my colleagues here from the Vietnam UK network who do the things, which is really important. Uh, just to say a little bit about us, we um, we just celebrated the same year last year uh, as uh, we celebrated 50 years of diplomatic relations. We celebrated the 10th year of the Vietnam UK network. This was founded by um, a former colleague of mine, uh, Warwick Morris, um, Ben Chapman, uh, and and Paul Smith, who together with the then Ambassador Ming, uh, came together to to look for an organisation that brought together uh, Vietnamese uh, communities, Vietnamese people in the UK, and British people who are more interested in finding out more about Vietnam. And I think it comes in with something that you were saying about consciousness raising, right? So so you are very deep 
in every sense. I mean, you, you, you've got a lot of knowledge and wow, look how many professors you've got. I mean, it's, uh, it's really impressive. I feel kind of quite humbled by, by seeing that. And I think it's about joining up the dots between the various parts of all of us uh, to, to look for opportunities and to bear each other in mind to say, ah, oh, well, I'm not an expert on that, but I know somebody, for example, from the Vietnamese Intellectual Society who could talk about that, or in our case, well, maybe this company would be really interested in that. So, and I think it's your 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 um your thinking seems to be going in the in the same direction about joining up, you know, the intellectuals, the community societies, um, business, uh, and and the embassies because I think the embassies are. Uh, Doctor Tu was 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 here, um, but I know I know the embassy are going to be taking part as well. The British embassy in Hanoi, the Vietnamese embassy in. Um, uh, in in London, so all of us looking for opportunities, and then as as somebody else was saying, looking at about how we can then maybe join in with uh, with media to, to to raise that. So you've got some of you who are already quite well known in in Vietnam, some of you well known in in the UK, and you mentioned um, Jonathan Van Tam, who uh, obviously is a very very famous your honorary chair, who's very famous and who grew up in the Lincolnshire countryside, just about 10 miles away from where I grew up at the same time. So I'd love to love to talk to him about that as well as Vietnam. So um, that was a little bit impromptu. But just to say, I think your, your initiative about bringing people together, and so we have a, a deep, uh, but also a wide uh, network of, of all the organizations would be great. So uh, just on behalf of the Vietnam UK network, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, we're looking forward to um, to the lunch as well as this. So we have the intellectual stimulation, but also the um, uh, the uh, the food and the culinary stimulation. So thank you very much on behalf of the Vietnam UK network for inviting us, one and uh, congratulations again for all your activities. Wow! Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the guys who and a lot of ideas in there. Thank you. I think that very soon we will have the two speakers. Maybe can we apologize? Maybe a few more minutes. I want to hear a bit from our own members. Do you have any idea, any suggestion for us in 24? Anyone? Very quick one. I know that there are a number of people online as well. And then unfortunately, we may not be able to, to hear online right away. But Vin, yes. Thank you. This is my first time here in person, and I'm from Durham University. Um, I'm also glad to see a few of us from North England coming to join today. And I, I kind of just want to have a quick question about, because last year, a few colleagues that when I told them about BIS and um, co colleagues in the UK, and I think the struggle is to know what our members uh, specialized in. So if we can have somewhere on the website that we can show that so it's easier to find collaboration um and i think that i really like the idea about conferences because last year just me and another colleague we just randomly traveled to vietnam and joined a biology conference i'm in psychology um but we do a lot of work in like life science related to collecting physio and bio data so we joined a bio conference in vietnam i think it's in Quy Yen, and um we were very delighted um, to learn about, you know, the conference and learn about um, people. I, I definitely, because I, I grew up abroad for a long time, so definitely have some mishap in terms of cultural difference as well. So I think that was a great opportunity because we built a collaboration with a colleagues in, at International University. And I wonder if this has any plan in the future to create opportunities for us to connect with um colleagues in Vietnam, just because I'm aware of a few grants that, you know, try to build that connection, especially both in Scotland and in England as well. Um, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, can you hear me from here? Eh? First of all, that we do put everything on website, our expertise from our member. If you look through the list of that, you can see that briefly who in what area. And definitely the collaboration is that we are here for. We, we have its member. I can see even psychology. You can we can introduce work with engineering people because even myself, I, I recently I worked with psychology people. How we can measure cognitive load? All, only the human being, brain can can stand so much stress or stress in the in the in the stressful environment. You know, so we can do that some engineering point with that. So definitely that's something we want to do interdisciplinary 
collaboration with that. Uh, yes, I don't know what, but maybe we can share more detail in the other activity connect with Vietnam. Definitely, we, we, we did a lot already. We share a, a lot of opportunities with that. Maybe, I don't know if we... Uh, I think one of the things is, hmm? uh, except from the results, collaboration, that existing collaboration, from education, exchange, um, a kind of program with university, which we are not aware of. So I think maybe we should also ask if any one come from university where they have like articulation program with Vietnam or many collaborations, you know, besides from research as well, because from there we can build a foundation for research. Uh, yep. We can ask that one. Okay. Maybe we we about time we stop, but I think that we invite all the members to here to take photo while you stay there, Vinh Yen and Quy Anh, quickly. And now, uh, Yen, I, can I invite you to chair the next section? We yeah. got two uh, keynote speaker. Would I say even though that we do uh, we don't have a lot of time, but that's really one of the highlight of this AGM that we have so two talks very important. And all over to you now, from now on, Jian, can you just share the session? So do you want to take a photo of us, or I'm talking about uh, it? Yes, can you take a photo for us? Vân, uh, yeah. is here. Okay, that's that's this one. Okay, thank you. so now thank, thank you, you very much. Much. So I look at you. So again, in relation to our kind of overall purpose and also the mission and the wish that we wanted to create a collaboration, uh, connecting all the intellectual in the society, which we call the community of academic here, working in different university and different discipline as well. And our wish is that we would join together collaboratively to address the similar challenge with our country facing with, or the two countries facing with, which is the UK and, and, and Vietnam. So in that, in that kind of connections today, I have really great honor to invite two guest speaker who are actually professor here at Cambridge. Uh, so Dr. Uh, professor uh, David Sebon from uh, Professor of Mech uh, Me uh, Mechanical Engineering, and he's also director of the Sustainable uh, Road Freight. Now I have a connection with uh, Professor Sebon from the project we're doing on decarbonization uh, in transport using the uh, digital twins. And I'm part of the business model and so Professor Sebon um, is, uh, is in charge of more the engineering part. So Professor Sebon uh, will um, join us today and give a talk um, on this kind of uh, socially addressed or common addressed issues on climate change and decarbonization, uh, particularly which his work and his center. Um, after that, I would like to invite Professor uh, Jaideep um, Brahu, and uh, Jaideep is working here at the Judge Business School as well. And Jaideep has done so much work on innovation and marketing in emerging market. And why innovation in emerging market? Because we're knowing that in order to spread the technological development and innovation to other countries like Vietnam, we are one of the emerging market. We need to see how we actually contextualize the innovation in, how the innovation immersed there, how they should be uh, stimulated, nurtured, and also um, regulated as well. And Professor Jaideep We'll talk about that uh, after Professor uh, Sibon. So may I have uh, Professor Sibon to the state? Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, you guys. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Good. Well, it's a great honor to be invited to talk here today. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, the talk that I'm going to give comes out of um, it's about two years old. Two years ago, I was invited by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO, to um, take part in a discussion associated with what's called the JETP Agreement. I don't know exactly how you say that. It's the Just Energy Transition Partnership. And that is... Uh, uh, a uh, partnership that came out of COP26, which was in Glasgow uh, in 2021. Um, and uh, there's, uh, uh, UK had responsibility for organizing a, uh, a program with Vietnam and the FCDO was uh, asked me to, to, uh, to be involved. So I had to quickly learn a little bit about energy energy in Vietnam, and uh, uh, so this is what came out of, out of that. So I'd just like to look at uh, the, the, the Vietnamese energy system from a very, very high level and, and uh, start off by looking at, at some, some recommendations from two different organizations about what Vietnam should do, and I'm just going to compare them and we'll draw some conclusions, it's very simple. So there are two reports that I uh, uh, looked at. One is this called Vietnam Energy Outlook, uh, uh, Outlook. and it's a report by essentially uh, some consultants from, Den from Denmark, and it's the Danish Energy Agency, uh, who have been working in Vietnam. This is the 2021 version. They had a number of previous versions. They've been working in Viet with Vietna Vietnam, on the energy system for some years. And then the other one on the right is the National Power Development Plan. This is the official document. Uh, this one's called PDP-8, Power Development Plan number eight. Uh, and this is, uh, so this is essentially pro by, produced by a consultant, but essentially produced for, for the National Power uh, Authority. And these are different, these two things. And it's interesting to see how they're different. So what were the recommendations of the Danish uh, study? Well, this is a complicated picture. Um, what have we got here? We've got um, petajoules of energy. That's the amount of energy generated in the vertical axis. And we've got 2030, 2040, 2050. And then these are different scenarios. So BSL is, oops, is, is called the baseline. Uh, GTP, GT is green transport. GP is green power, AP is, is air pollution, and NZ is net zero. So these are the scenarios that they looked at, and then they've looked at different kinds of arrangements. And I'm interested in the net zero scenario, because that's the one that really we should be focusing on. And what does it have? It has wind energy, it has solar energy, it has hydroelectricity, and Vietnam is blessed with a huge amount of hydroelectricity. Uh, has some biofuels and it has some fossil fossil fuels at the bottom and you can see how all the other ones work and they all add up to approximately the same amount of energy so that's the broad scenario um, and the net zero option you can see there is almost entirely renewables uh, here is the carbon emissions from those different options again 2030 2040 2050 in megatons and you can see that the net zero solution is the one that generates the low emissions, of course, and that's what we'd expect. Uh, all of the other ones uh, generate quite high levels of emissions from agriculture, commercial industry, transport, and so on. So the net zero one has, uh, is the only one which gets, in fact, it's the only one which is on the two degree C target, the two degree of global warming. Now, this is about uh, energy imports, and it shows you how much energy is imported. And again, 
uh, all of these other scenarios involve in importing a lot of energy into Vietnam, which is an energy security issue. And we've seen the sort of things that happen with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the, the challenges for energy security that have come when you depend on somebody else for your energy. And so all of these scenarios, apart from net zero and actually uh, something over on the left-hand side, which is kind of a bit uh, now, but the, uh, the only one really which gives credible energy security is the net zero solution. So the only scenario that solves the energy problem, 90% of the energy is from domestic sources and 10% from imports. And Vietnam becomes essentially self-sufficient, which should be the aim of every country in my, in my opinion. What about the cost of energy? Well, this is a slightly different presentation. And what you've got here is all the different ways of generating electricity. And on the right, you've got um, off onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, and so on. And you can see that they're actually the cheapest. In 2050, they're the cheapest as well. So it's the lowest cost also. And they're not necessarily quite the lowest cost before that. But once you get out into the long term, uh, they're the cheapest. So renewables are the lowest cost by 20. 50. What about PDPA? What about the official government document? Well, this is what it proposes. Coal, biomass, ammonia-fired power stations. This is, it's 2045. Uh, so we're going to burn ammonia and coal in 2045, that much of it, 37 megawatts, and con combined cycle gas turbine using LNG and hydrogen. We're going to burn hydrogen in power stations and we're going to burn coal and co-fire ammonia that means mixing ammonia which is made from hydrogen in fact uh, mixing ammonia with coal and we're going to burn that now this is the official government position and it's a bit different to the danish one you can see so let's compare these two options and i'm going to just compare them with one graphic which i generated to just try and give a picture of how this works so the top one here is the, uh, is the PDP-8. And in the PDP-8, it's got 34 gigawatts generated by co-firing ammonia and 28 gigawatts generated by what is called CCGT, which is combined cycle gas turbine. It means a gas power station. And we have many of them now burning methane, not hydrogen. Uh, so these together give 62 gigawatts and just as a matter of interest, that's about double the amount of electricity that the UK uses on average every year. Um, the average power usage in the UK. So it's it's uh, that's the recommendation. It's not the that's not the whole picture. That's just part of the picture. Now, if you're going to generate electricity with co-firing ammonia, you have various losses in getting that ammonia. And what I'm interested in is how do you get from over here, oops, from Vietnam on the left, the wind, the solar, onshore, offshore, hydro, how do we get this electricity? That's the question. Where does it come from? So I'm going to show you what has to happen in order to get it, or at least a very high view, level view of it. Well, first of all, if you're going to have 34 gigawatts of electricity in people's homes, you're going to have to transmit it, transmit it over the electricity grid. You lose about 10% of the energy doing that. And so you have to start with 37.5 gigawatts that you transmit. Okay, but that's not all the story because that's come from, in this case, a co-fired, co-firing of ammonia and coal. And to generate 37.5 gigawatts of electricity, in a coal-fired power station, which I very generously said might be 50% efficient, uh, you need 37.5 gigawatts of, of uh, coal and 37.5 gigawatts of ammonia if you have half and half. And it generates a lot of waste heat. So you start with um, 75 uh, gigawatts of, uh, of energy coming in, and you only have half of that coming out, and the rest goes up as heat. And that happens in every thermal power station you lose most, at least, at least half as heat. So we have to start with 37.5 
gigawatts of coal, which we're burning and it's generating emissions. That's the emissions that it generates uh, by burning the coal. But the ammonia comes from electricity. And the electricity, to make ammonia, you use a process called the Haber-Bosch process, which takes hydrogen and nitrogen from the air and it combines them together. And it's about 60% efficient. So to generate 37.5 gigawatts of ammonia, you need 63 gigawatts of green hydrogen. Green hydrogen means hydrogen made by electrolysis of water. So you take green electricity and at about 71% efficiency, you generate green hydrogen. Again, more waste heat. All of these processes generate waste heat. So you're wasting energy every time you go through one of these processes and just disappears into the environment. So we've got the electrolysis process. We've got uh, uh, AC-DC conversion. We needed 83 gigawatts of electricity to do this. To generate 83 gigawatts of electricity, you need 208 gigawatts of installed capacity of wind turbines, um, offshore, offshore wind turbines. If, they, if you did offshore, you didn't have to do it offshore. You could have onshore wind, you could have offshore wind, you could have any other solar nuclear power stations, whatever you want, however you generate it. But if you do it with offshore wind, you need 208 gigawatts of installed capacity. That is 17,000 wind turbines. And it takes us an area of 28,000 square kilometers. And that's the area actually in blue that is to scale with the map. So that is the size of C that you would need to generate that much electricity because you know you have to generate 83 gigawatts there you only get 34 gigawatts at this end all right you started with 83 gigawatts of electricity why not just use that never never mind all this stuff in between you had to have 83 gigawatts of electricity to generate 34. now what you could have done of course is the australians could have generated that electricity and they could have shipped you the ammonia in a ship that's possible and it would cost about the same a bit more for shipping so that's, that's another alternative amongst it all there in, in that. Or maybe not the Australians, but somebody else. So what about the CCGT? Well, if you want 28 gigawatts of electricity from CCGT, you go back through the same process, and it looks like this, that you need another 174 gigawatts of on offshore wind in order to generate that other bit at the bottom. So the total that you end up with is 383 gigawatts of offshore wind needed to generate this scheme. Uh, and it's 52,000 square kilometers of sea. Now, the UK currently generates 12 gigawatts of offshore wind. Okay, that's just for comparison. We've been installing offshore wind for years, you know, 15 years, and we have 12, 14 gigawatts of it. The UK's big plan for 2030 is 50 gigawatts of offshore wind. So it makes you wonder, what's the alternative if we just use electricity, renewable electricity directly? Well, if you want 62 gigawatts, which is what we end up with at the top, you need to start with 69 gigawatts and you're transmitted by the electricity grid. And, you, and that takes 173 gigawatts of installed wind. It's still a hell of a lot, but it's only less than half of what you do in the other direction. And you have no carbon emissions, whereas in the one above, we've got all of that coal that we're burning, which is still generating carbon emissions. So PDP-8 requires 2.2 times more renewables to generate the same amount of electricity. It's complex and it's expensive, it has large carbon emissions, about a, a thousand megatons per annum. And, but it has one advantage in that, and that is it gives you some storage capacity for electricity. Now, actually, Vietnam has all that hydro and all that hydro can be used as pump storage. And in fact, Vietnam has fabulous capability for electricity storage. That's a whole other story, which I don't have time to talk about. So where did the ammonia co-firing idea come from? Well, it came from Japan. And here is a story about that. The Japanese Ministry of Economy and Trade began promoting its, its roadmap for ammonia fuel 
in 2021. And it's promoting it around the region, around Southeast Asia. Why? Well, Japan is wedded to hydrogen and the hydrogen economy. You see that they have this Mirai uh, hydrogen vehicle, which is almost completely unsuccessful in the face of electric vehicle manufacturer going completely crazy around the world. The Mirai is selling 3,000 hydrogen vehicles. For some reason, which I don't understand, Japan is wedded to a hydrogen economy and they're looking for validation around the Southeast Asia region and they're looking for company, countries to come on board and to join them in this co-firing of ammonia idea. And you can see a bunch of, you know, just look, look it up, look up co-firing of ammonia. All the analyses of it say that it's costly, expensive, doesn't decarbonize, uh, and there's alternative ways to go. So the, what are my conclusions? The net zero strategy would be very attractive for Vietnam. It's almost entirely renewable generation. It's the lowest cost, the lowest carbon, the lowest energy imports, so it gives self-sufficiency in energy. Co-firing ammonia in thermal power stations is misguided. It has high carbon emissions, it has high cost, it has high complexity, and a likely high dependency on imported energy. And it will delay or derail the energy transition because so much effort will have to go into making offshore wind to generate this huge amount of energy, which just gets wasted as heat in the process that I've shown. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, thank you for listening. I hope that's been interesting. And I hope that one of the things that you will do is take ideas back to Vietnam and encourage sensible thinking on these things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sivan. And that's, um, that's actually really important that we have done a lot of research in the UK and together with our project on decarbonization, for example, maybe we can extend that to the context of Vietnam. And that would be like through digital twin, you can also kind of like uh, stimulate that one. And especially at the moment, we do a lot on transport, but I think in relation to that, there will be a lot of things in, in relation. I uh, thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, so in the next, uh, in the next section, I would like to invite Professor Brahu. Uh, professor Brahu is Professor of Innovation and Marketing. He has done a lot of work in emerging market, uh, understanding how we can actually uh, globalize the innovation. Now, building innovation is not about technology transfer because that is only resource transfer, right? At the end of the day, in order to build a sustainability for development, we need to build our innovative capability, or we call um, uh, innovation capability. And Professor um, Brahu will share some of his views and his research as well to see how we actually can spread the uh, core competence to the um, to the developing country, especially in the, in relation to some of the upcoming technology development. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank uh, Bang and Yen for inviting me, and congratulations to all of you on a wonderful uh, event. And thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, very uh, thought-provoking. Um, so my area of interest is innovation. Um, and I've studied innovation uh, in, in uh, various contexts. Uh, initially, I studied innovation in large Western corporations in high-tech sectors. Um, and then I turned my attention to innovation in emerging markets. Around 2007 or so, I began to look at how large multinationals, the world's largest companies that are also the biggest spenders on innovation, had begun to look at emerging markets as a place to do innovation. That was quite a, a dramatic shift because for most of the 20th century, even as companies had offshored manufacturing to countries like China or Vietnam, 
or back office stuff to places like India or uh, the Philippines, innovation had stayed close to home uh, in the headquarters. So it had stayed in large multinational uh, corporations close to the headquarters, which were typically in the so-called triad countries of North America, Western Europe, and Japan. But in the 2000s, this began to change quite dramatically. And we began to see much more activity in emerging economies. But the academic literature had not caught up. Most of the research had, was based on 20th century data. So my co-authors and I uh, decided to um, decided to look at this question again around 2007 or so and collect some fresh data that might I need the slides. Yeah. Second one? Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks so much. So uh, we began to look at this question again. And we looked at a sample of the five, uh, 500 largest multinationals globally, covering some of these very important sectors, uh, high-tech sectors. Uh, we left out financial services because they're somewhat different. And we looked at where these large companies uh, had their largest uh, or the most popular destinations for their significant R&D centers. And these were the 21 top locations uh, or the 21 top nations where the Fortune 500 were locating R&D in 2008, 2007, when we started to look at this. So as you can see, many of them are indeed the advanced economies, and this was where most of innovation happened in the 20th century. But you'll see that increasingly there were emerging markets also in this list. Uh, and so uh, we looked uh, at uh, how many R&D centers were in these countries. Uh, we just looked uh, at how many in, in total were across these countries. And what was interesting to us was that in about 2007, 2008, while the top three, for top four destinations were emerging economies, number five and seven were emerging economies. And if we had done this study, say, 10 years before in the late 90s, China and India probably would not have been in that list. So they had very dramatically increased the number of R&D centers that were in those locations. Um, and then you see Brazil uh, further down. We looked at a number of different things, but one of the things we were interested in was what was driving the attractiveness of a nation for, country, for companies to set up R&D in the nation. And there are a number of hypotheses one could explore. For instance, it could be linked to economic performance or simply something like the country's GDP, or it could be linked to growth, which could be increase in GDP year on year, or it could be linked to intellectual property rights protection. How rigorous is that uh, kind of regime? Uh, or it could be linked to scientific capability, quite simply how many people are trained every year in basic science and engineering. Uh, when I did interviews uh, of companies uh, in the Fortune 500 that had set up R&D centers in new countries, uh, such as China or India, they often uh, said that it was access to talent was the reason why they were doing this. So we tested uh, these hypotheses. And what we found, in fact, when we included all these factors together was that one factor dominated, and that was, in fact, scientific capability. And this is simply the number of uh, scientists and engineers that the country produced in a particular year. This, of course, means that universities play a very important role. And as an example of the kinds of centers that they were, sending, uh, they were setting up, GE set up uh, what is now its largest R&D center in the world in Bangalore in South India, my hometown. Um, it's a $100 million facility. They have about now about 4,500 scientists and engineers working on various projects of uh, global import, um, as you can see that. Um, in China, for instance, GSK, I uh, interviewed people extensively at GSK. They had looked at countries around the world as a place to locate some of their central nervous system uh, disease uh, related research. So things like Parkinson's and so on. And out of all the countries that they could look at, they decided to focus uh, and do this in China. 
And one of the reasons why they decided to do this in China was to, uh, to build on the quality of chi Chinese science in this area. So very significant R&D centers were being set up in the 2000s. And initially, they were working on uh, you know, essentially global projects you know, uh, where the central headquarters still retained a lot of strategic control. And what, what was happening was sort of labor arbitrage. They were using relatively large numbers of scientific uh, personnel in those emerging markets to work on some often non-strategic aspect of these programs. But that began to change. Over time, many of these uh, R&D centers, people running these R&D centers in emerging markets, realized they were missing the opportunity to innovate for the home market. So in India, for instance, GE realized that the medical devices that they were developing, uh, they had taken medical devices like ECG machines that they had developed for Western countries. They would defeature them a bit, drop the price a bit, and then sell them in India. But those machines would only reach the big city hospitals, whereas the majority of the population was in the countryside, and often those clinics would not be able to afford these very expensive ECG machines. And in any case, typically doctors would go on a day trip from the country, from the city to the countryside to work in the, in the clinics. So they realized the ECG machines couldn't look like that. They had to be like that, fit in a doctor's bag, be highly affordable, of course, uh, be portable, run on batteries, and so on. And they also realized that they had to approach the making of these instead of doing it that traditional way, which would be to have a big R&D team, big budget, uh, trying to push the technology frontier for the sake of doing it, they would have to do frugal innovation, copying that Chinese and Indian competitors who would work backwards from the specification, often using off-the-shelf components to come up with a solution faster, better, cheaper. So they did precisely that to come up with this portable ECG device. They knew what the specification was. Then they said, OK, what do we need to make something like this? We uh, probably need a printer. OK, let's see. Uh, what if we use bus ticket printers? We could use those components. They're off the shelf. Uh, we can even use the paper they use. That would be cheaper. Uh, OK, we have key keypads. Well, well, maybe telephones have keypads. We could use those uh, components. So. Uh, they took off the shelf components, they uh, cut and paste them, so to speak, they applied a quality control standard, and they had this product faster, better, cheaper. Initially very successful in India, they had a similar product in China, and then they got FDA approval to introduce these into Western markets as well. So this idea of frugal innovation became very big uh, in the multinational companies. Uh, Siemens, for instance, uh, in its R&D center in Bangalore, introduced a whole suite of products they call smart products where SMART stands for simple, maintenance-free, affordable, reliable, and timely to market. These are all the things needed for emerging markets uh, to, make, uh, to meet the demand, to make things that are affordable, but also timely to market as these markets evolve very quickly. Um, and you know, they entered not only in areas like medical devices, but also industrial products. And initially they thought, okay, this is for emerging economies, and of course, they could extend it to other emerging economies. But eventually, they realized that there was a global market at the lower end of the market uh, across, across countries around the world. Uh, now, the Chinese have been doing this for a long time, applying their expertise in manufacturing, and interestingly, taking high technology and applying it to the mass market. So frugal innovation does not have to be low tech. It can be high tech. Uh, BYD is a very interesting example of a Chinese company that has done this. So with lithium ion batteries, for instance, um, they looked at the process of making those batteries to reduce the cost. So by manufacturing them at room temperature, they could take the cost from $40 uh, dollars per unit to around $12 dollars per unit. And soon they became a world leader in initially small batteries for mobile devices and so on. Uh, but having be, uh, achieved some expertise in battery technology, uh, they then went into uh, uh, an adjacent market, uh, electric vehicles. We were talking about electric vehicles earlier. Uh, they went into an adjacent market, uh, and at the moment, they are dominating the world market for electric vehicles, taking on Tesla, uh, including not just in China, but even in, in Europe. And in fact, the German auto industry, which dominated the uh, uh, internal combustion engine uh, industry and supply chain is now being challenged by companies like uh, BYD. India has similar ambitions in Tata Motors. This people's car, the idea was you first develop it for India, 
then you can take it to other emerging markets and then potentially the globe. And my colleague, Peter Williamson, who studies China and has written a book called Dragons at Your Door, points out that these emerging market companies that initially dominate their home markets through frugal innovation can then compete internationally. He gives the example of uh, the wine cooler industry, these wine fridges, uh, where in the US, the US uh, brand La Sommelier uh, sold a wine cooler for $1,600. Uh, when higher, the Chinese company entered the market uh, uh, with a product about half the price, and they were able to grow the market uh, dramatically and take a very large share of the market uh, in the US uh, a year after or two years after their launch. Now, I just want to talk very briefly about the role of the state and how states in emerging markets are doing frugal innovation. Uh, I'll first talk about the case of India. Um, uh, in India, uh, in 2009, the new government that uh, had been elected invited this person, Ananda Nelekani, who was the former CEO and founder of one of India's most uh, successful software companies, uh, Infosys, that had done back office stuff very frugally, so had done back office work using a very frugal uh, business model, invited him to come into government to solve a very big problem for uh, the uh, public distribution system. So India had a lot of subsidies and programs for lower income communities, but the problem was a lot of people who were targets of those benefits could not claim those benefits because they didn't have a way of proving their identity. They did not have a passport or driving license. In many cases, they didn't even have a birth certificate. So they were not able to claim the benefits that were due to them. At the same time, you had people who created fake IDs who were drawing and defrauding the state, and often uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, large amounts of money were being siphoned off from the state. So this solution he proposed was a very simple solution, was to give every Indian a unique 12-digit number as an ID, which was linked to their uh, fingerprints and their iris scan. Uh, and the, uh, the state proceeded with this policy. In about five years, they were able to give practically every Indian uh, this unique ID at less than a dollar per ID. And this, in the first year that was introduced, linking this unique ID to the benefit system saved the government more money than the whole uh, uh, project had cost uh, the government. And not only that, but the state has now gone on to build on this digital ID foundation to, for instance, do financial inclusion at scale. So uh, one of the big successes that India has had recently is in building the so-called India stack, which is a completely digital stack for financial services. So you have the digital ID, you have digital signatures, you have digital lockers where people's documents can be kept, and then you have the so-called unified payments interface where you have interoperable payments that are possible on mobile phones. So hundreds of millions of people have been taken out of the informal economy operating purely in cash into the digital economy and into the banking system. Now, India has also, in another area of the public sphere, done frugal innovation uh, to drive its space program. So for many years, they had very low budgets. The government did not have money to spend. There were lots of um, uh, 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 constraints placed on what India could get in terms of technology transfer from the advanced nations. And so ISRO, India's NASA, has basically developed uh, on frugal principles throughout, uh, focusing very much on the uh, the developmental objectives of doing uh, space research. So it's not about science, it's not about Cold War race, it's about helping farmers, it's about ha helping rural communities through satellites, predicting the weather and so on. Um, and they have, for instance, sent a, a mission to uh, Mars, uh, which cost less than uh, 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 some certain Hollywood films uh, have cost. Um, and their whole approach is to focus on simple objectives uh, which are within their budgets. OK, so let me just conclude by saying that uh, the world of uh, innovation has significantly shifted over the last couple of decades. Emerging markets are now playing a very significant role where multinationals are uh, setting up large R&D centers in these emerging markets. Um, very often, they are tapping into the talent in those markets, but they're also seeing a huge market opportunity in those markets. But in order to tap into that, they have to do frugal innovation. They have to do innovation that's highly affordable. So I was struck by your point about the importance of renewables. Renewable is a great example of frugal innovation. And so it's interesting to see that the cost of that will also be, by 2050, very low. Um, now, when you do that, domestic firms that do frugal innovation for their home markets could be tremendously successful in the home markets. 
but then they can take that success to other emerging markets in the first instance, South-South, but then potentially also to the developed markets. And in all this, the state can play a role in doing frugal innovation itself, uh, in how it delivers services to its uh, citizens, uh, how it does its own kind of programs, including its space and telecommunications programs, but also very importantly in regulating and supporting the rest of the economy to do frugal innovation. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So every country, every nation at the moment have similar agenda, uh, especially in climate change, for example. We all want to raise the to join the same race by 2050, for example, to reach the net zero. But every country starts in a certain stage of development of infrastructure, of government, of policy, of regulation, and even technological, uh, technological capability as well. So how do we actually reach there, given our condition? That is about the developing the innovation, which is actually suitable or localized to our country. So frugal innovation is a concept that you actually produce innovation, which actually fit your context, will also help you you to reach the goal, but having cost efficiency, have a productivity, has time to the market and fit to the condition. Therefore, having ability to develop the R&D locally, right, not just using the foreign direct investment as a source to rely on, but trying to sustainably develop our own innovation from our own emerging market multinational company. Realizing also very important of the returnee entrepreneur, the, those who are uh, scientists like we are, right? That will change working abroad and actually bring that knowledge back home and maybe build an R&D center in Vietnam and tailor to the solution of the local so that we can all join the same race and reaching the same agenda like other countries as well. So I'm thank you so much for the two guest speakers. I'm not quite sure if we have any time for the, for the questions. Maybe if in the audience, if you have any question for the two guest speaker, um, we're always running out a bit of time, but I guess that uh, is there anyone. Yes, please. Uh, so thank you for um, the two speakers. So I, my question for David. Um, so the assumption that you make uh, in order to produce the ammonia and also coal is from the electricity based on uh, uh, offshore wind. But I'm just curious, currently, how do they do that? Maybe that because you make that assumption, then of course it's much more inefficient to 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 do that. But of course, Japan, you 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 raise the point of the Japan that maybe they they have a different way to introduce or uh, to to kind of produce that one that we don't know yet i'm i'm just curious there's two points okay. there's two two important uh, points here first of all is i showed you the ratio of energy required for those two different routes. And I said it was 2.2 times more. 2.2 times more wind turbines, uh, offshore wind, uh, for the, the uh, PDP-8 route than for the renewable route. And that 2.2 is a factor no matter what you do, right? You need 2.2 times more electricity. So whether you generate by offshore wind or whether you import it from Australia in a high voltage DC cable, or whether you have a nuclear power station that's making it, or whatever it is, it's two times, 2.2 times more that you need. And interesting, interestingly, you need 2.2 times more wind turbines, you need 2.2 times more area of sea, you need 2.2 times more grid connections, you need 2.2 times more maintenance people, you need 2.2 times more spare parts, it costs 2.2 times more. So the PDP-8 solution will cost the country 2.2 times more to provide the energy than the renewable solution. No matter how you look at it, it has to cost 2.2 times more. Now, can you do it with something else? Of course, you can do it with all sorts of things you can do. Japan's plan is to import ammonia from Australia they don't think they can generate the renewables. They can, they can do offshore wind, but they think that they're going to import ammonia from Australia. It's completely misguided. It's a crazy idea. 
they would be much better generating their own electricity offshore, offshore wind, or however other alternative they've got. The worst thing they can do is be making hydrogen in Australia to power their economy. It's an incredibly expensive thing to do. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Maybe also to, to Professor Bahu? Uh, and, uh, my own thoughts on why you see Japan doing something like this. Um, so, you know, when it comes to innovation, where, as I said, it was mostly done in the developed world, you know, for the 20th century, for the developed world. Uh, and then it would trickle down to the emerging world, if at all. And really the uh, economic model in the developed world for innovation is that it's an expensive activity and you pass that cost on to the consumer because the consumer can afford it. Uh, so you make your profits uh, not from the volume, but from the margin. So you, you charge high prices to cover your costs and you, can, you don't have to reach a large number of people. That equation is inverted in emerging economies because you don't have that many people who can afford the high prices, but you have a lot of people who could afford an affordable product. So often you'll see why you see frugal innovation in emerging markets is because the way you make your profits is not for your margins. Your margins may be very thin, but from the volumes. Uh, and so and I think many Japanese corporations like Western European and North American followed this high tech for high cost model. Uh, but I think the challenge for emerging markets is to do low tech for high, uh, for high volumes at low cost or high tech for low cost. And I think renewables are high tech for low cost and not just cost to the individual consumer, but to society, if you include the externalities, the negative externality costs of uh, CO2 emissions and heat emissions and climate change. I absolutely agree with everything you said, but there's one other thing, and that is that that cost, that 2.2 times more, that has to be paid for by the economy. So all that energy on my graph, which is heat going up, you have to pay for that. It has to be generated. And in the end, you pay for that by subsidies uh, for the, you know, it could be going to the consumer. The consumer can't afford to heat their house. We've seen that in, in the UK. So you end up subsidizing that because the cost of it, heat is, or energy is too high. So if, I think what's really important and people don't seem to get is that energy efficiency leads directly to economic efficiency. If you're energy efficient in your economy, it generates headroom for tax or for spending on hospitals or schools. If you waste energy, you have to pay for it. And that has to come out of the economy, has to come from tax, has to come from consumers. So it's so important just to, to not waste energy and the worst waste of energy comes from fossil fuels. And, and the key principle of frugal innovation is not to waste anything, yeah. energy is not, but food for it. So the whole point is can you make everything circular, which is not easily done, but that's a key principle of frugal yeah. innovation. So even if there's waste produced, you know, waste energy, can you recycle it in some way? So I would like to invite uh, his ambassador and have some comments. No, no, no. I just want to have a very small, uh, a very small question uh, for the professor. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, and uh, we'll have engaged in a very personal conversation about that. Extremely important for Vietnam that transition. But a very key question is the price. So we all know that offshore wind is very good. The curves go down very steeply. It would go, you know, in the 20 by, by 2050, is you know, the prices are down. But if you are going to invest now, it's this require a huge uh, amount of capital that a country like Vietnam cannot afford. Uh, you know, it's like four million dollars per uh, gigawatt. If you go, um, um, you go, um, for, for megawatt, if you go for at least a minimum of three gigawatt, it required 12 billion US dollars, right? And a country like Vietnam cannot afford a project like of that size. And um, and the prices 
you see here the uh, the scheme of the uh, uh, the difference, okay? And they they have uh, they can afford that because the 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 government is going to guarantee you a very uh, constant price uh, for 20 years, for 30 years, and and pay the differences, or you pay back to the government, or the government pay back to you. But they guarantee after the auction, uh, the last option, option like four, uh, for, uh, I think it's 40 pounds per megawatt hour. It's, it's very, very cheap, but only the UK government can do that. A country like Vietnam, why we are changing and transition from a country heavily um, based on coal fire plan, and they change that uh, to a net zero by 2050. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and we committed to have a maximum of 36 gigawatt uh, of coal fire uh, by, uh, I think, 2035, but not uh, over 32 gigawatt by 2030. So I think the solution that they do in the PTPA is to use the existing and extending the coal-fired plants up to that because of the prices. And then, uh, and, and now they, so many people talking about offshore wind, but in, in order to implement a project of offshore wind, you need at least seven to eight years and multiple by the capacity. And, 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 and then the prices is still very high. This is the most important thing for Vietnam. How come you can afford that? Of course, we agree that offshore wind is the way out to commit to net zero, but then who's going to pay for that? It's very high prices. So I think, I think that, you know, what I say is, is uh, very interesting. The, uh, I think there's a few, a few things. First of all, it doesn't have to be offshore wind. Offshore wind, uh, has been coming down in price. I don't think offshore wind is going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Offshore wind is very complicated and it's complicated technology. And as you get further and further offshore, it gets more complicated and it's not necessarily going to get cheaper. So, and I think that the Danish study under, understood that. And even still, uh, it showed that by 2050, uh, offshore wind would be the cheapest, uh, the, the, the renewables would be the cheapest option for Vietnam. I think the other thing is that if you're building new capacity now, the renewables are cheaper uh, than building new coal-fired capacity. Now, the coal-fired capacity in Vietnam has to run down. Uh, those fire power stations either have to be replaced or they, uh, they uh, will be turned into renewables. I mean, one way or another, those plants only have a finite life they have to be replaced. You can replace them with more coal fire and ammonia co-firing, or you can replace them with renewables. Renewables, mega, megawatt for megawatt, renewables are cheaper. So yeah, you can get a bit more life out of the existing coal, coal plant, but Vietnam's energy requirements are going up, rapidly going up as it industrializes and, right? right? So you need more and more, you've got to replace the existing coal plants and the renewables are cheaper, no matter how you look at it. So you can either pour effort into co-firing with ammonia, which doesn't produce any decarbonization benefit at all and requires vast amounts of energy to do, vast amounts of energy, 2.2 times more energy coming into the system if you're going to do it by renewables. In order, So it's a false, complete false economy. You have to build a lot more uh, energy generating capacity in order to do it uh, and it doesn't decarbonize and it's the and and, and the, the the people in the electricity company what they're really doing is preserving their position and they're preserving their jobs and they're preserving their existing coal-fired infrastructure they're sticking their head in the ground in the sand because it's more expensive it's higher carbon and it is uh, higher complexity and you know, and it doesn't and doesn't solve the problem. So, you know, the, the the very best thing for Vietnam to be doing now is to be investing in renewables and to be winding down the coal-fired plant and not to be uh, to be expanding it. It, of course, run it until it until it's dead. You know, make use of it. Don't switch it off. 
run it now. It's the cheapest, you know, the cheapest energy you're going to generate is with the existing plant. You don't have to put any capital into it. But if you're going to build a new plant, for heaven's sake, don't be building more coal fire and co-firing according to this Japanese plan because it doesn't make any sense. Build renewables, cheaper, lower carbon, energy security. It wins in every direction that, that Vietnam needs. Optimization and resources use that efficiency is always a big challenge for all countries, especially from strained resources like Vietnam. So how to actually more rely on resources, financial and use technology as well. So I'm also quite conscious now with the green point. What is the uh, and Vietnam and the UK and the forecast together. We should we come back to that topic. I like you have some comment on that as well, but I don't think we don't have time now. So maybe it will time to invite our His Excellency, the Ambassador, we found out. Then we come to the state, maybe together with you, Professor, to share some <laughs> uh, things to do. Thank you. If we cannot go without hearing from the Ambassador, only to use thank some thank of them. You. I yes. yeah. I, thank you, Professor Run, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to be present here. Well, actually, the two presentations are very interesting because um, it's really corresponding to what we talked during uh, my two visits to Cambridge uh, last year, is to establish a cooperation between the Cambridge uh, Zero uh, and, and, and the government of Vietnam. Uh, we have had opportunity to to have the uh, uh, you know, to organize the prime minister's Vietnam visit to the UK. It was postponed to uh, second half this year, probably. But at that time, I, I met with um, with the Cambridge, uh, I think Patel, who is in charge of international relations. Okay, he she she came to the embassy, and we talk about how we can have a a collaboration program between the Cambridge. Uh, zero and the government of Vietnam through the embassy and involving your expertise like uh, you have just said about the transition and uh, and everything now in Vietnam and everything regarding Vietnam Ukraine relationship is based on 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 climate and zero you talk about business you talk about investment you talk about technology everything education all those things are centered around the concept of net zero and climate uh, so basically, what we are talking about is um, the first and foremost is uh, the uh, the energy transition. You just uh, I work on the energy transition. I was the lead negotiator from the Vietnamese side to work with the FCDO uh, ambassador John Merton and the EU uh, climate ambassador uh, Mark Van Hoeklen. Uh, three of us. Uh, we have. Uh, we have negotiated the the JetP agreement, uh, and then we have a lot to talk. But uh, in order, uh, I want to tell that because I'd like to have more uh, in depth uh, discussion with experts like you and and other professors at the uh, in Cambridge. Uh, and that project, we also involve the Imperial College. They have the the. And they are very much focused on the green finance, the climate finance. So the first is the energy transition, but the second is the green finance, where we really want to have this uh, discussion uh, involving uh, also our Vietnamese uh, colleagues. And then the third, uh, I think is very important, is the technology. Um, uh, we talk about hydrogen, uh, we talk about ammonia, we talk the, the technology discussion of how country like uh, a developing country like Vietnam is going to have, you talk about the security, energy security. And to have energy security, you have also have the technological uh, sufficiency. Uh, uh, we need to, you know, we have to to be also secure uh, from the technological point of view. And the, the, the fourth point of view is we want to, to, to increase the exchange and share of the um, experiences, oh, yeah. uh, you know, you, you uh, the UK have developed the 12 gigawatt of offshore wind is going to have another 50 gigawatt by 2030. And you have a very uh, developed uh, legal scheme and all regulatory uh, frameworks 
that can be shared with Vietnamese uh, people of how to develop the market, how to attract investors, and how to to to, to get, uh, get things done. And uh, this is the fourth point. And of course, the very important and the last point is to increase the cooperation between scientific research institutions of both sides. Uh, we talk about the JP. JP is involved the G7 uh, country, but also Denmark and Norway, the World Bank. Yeah. So we want those high uh, technical skill from those partners to be, you know, in in with Vietnamese uh, partners. All those things, I think, is with your presentation and your presentation really intrinsically uh, related to each other. So uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for your presentation. I, I think uh, after this meeting, we really look forward to having uh, continuing this conversation because both presentations are really looking into the, the core elements of Vietnamese development, at least for the next stage. So, and uh, congratulations to our friends in the in the VIS, uh, Vietnam Intellectual Society. They are now uh, more and more important uh, to our relationship. Uh, you know, it's not uh, no, just no, because no. of you as yourself, Me? as a scientist or I researcher know. or professor who have Vietnam. You need more, uh, first and foremost, to be ambassador of your institution to Vietnam. So people in Cambridge, Professor Bang, very good in finance, but then you have other colleagues in in the in the Cambridge uh, Zero that can be very helpful to Vietnam, raising really really spot on uh, discussion about how this kind of so-called ammonia coal fire plant. I know there are a lot of interest and economic economic vested interest behind all those things. We understand that even in the UK, and so uh, but. In order to, you know, to convince politicians, we need to present to them uh, a very convincing uh, business model. So you will be helping us about that. So uh, the same discussion to other uh, professor of Vietnamese uh, colleagues uh, in, in the digital, in uh, communication, in finance, good finance, everything. We need you, and we need you to be the ambassador of Vietnam to every single institution you are in. So, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, there are so many plan already uh, for this, that uh, for VIS, that we only wanted to have a forum between the the government politician from Vietnam and all from us here in the UK, we got all the professor. And so we, we should have this. It's about the policy, about what we can do between the UK and Vietnam. So that's something on the pipeline for us, uh, as we said already. At, I think about over time already. So do you have any other thing? I have to say thank you so much to professor. It, re it really inspiring talk that even though we just got 15 minutes each, but absolutely we, we realize how important important topic, even that also the innovation so important. I hope we didn't have a chance to ask about Vietnam, but I know that I've been to Bangalore, you know, it's so much ongoing over there. We'd like to see Vietnam, same thing. Um, but just before we go, the thing that we wanted all of us to come down and to take a photo together before we move to the uh, celebration for our Lunar New Year as a tradition. May I invite two speakers as well to, to follow us to that uh, third celebration, please. But for now, can I ask you back to the step? Can I can I have the, some of the things that uh, from VIS we, we have? Uh, two speakers, yeah. David, please come. And Just to appreciate your, uh, just really to appreciate that you came and help us to share your thought and view to have some small presence and again thank you so much for the time it's saturday and oh, thanks everyone hello um, just, just a few logistic issue, okay? Can, can, can I have your uh, attention for just two seconds, okay? 
for the pictures, just walk down the stairs and go out of the building. I have our picture in front of the building. Okay, first. And then to go to the uh, lunch uh, place. You have basically now two choices because we are a little bit over time. If you have a car park here, we're going to open the car park and you can go there by car. Okay, and then you have to find a new parking uh, uh, nearby the uh, Westminster College. Or you can let the car here and call a taxi. Uh, I think that you, you are given with the, the, the number of Panther taxi from here to Westminster College. It's going to take you five minutes and maybe a few pounds. Okay, so I think either car, by car or or by taxi, you should be there in something like 10 minutes or so. Okay, thank you. Can you just all go out of the building and uh, in the front of the building, please?
con kể nó lên facebook nó lên nó coi bài đăng nó mi xong rồi quẹo đi coi lại lịch sử cái thấy cái nó còn cái nó con kỳ nó không có làm xong kỳ nó biết tìm kiếm